Let me begin, uh, if I may, with some introductions, including myself. Um, my name is Lee Howell. I say that very deliberately, slowly, because in this part of the world, they think I'm saying hello. So, um, a member of the managing board and head of global programming at the World Economic Forum. <laughs> you have a bit of a fact. Uh, yeah, exactly. No, um, that's. Uh, that was a surprise. Um, <laughs> um, to my immediate left, I've family's attending. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, I had the great honor and privilege of introducing one of our co-chairs this year, uh, Minister Navdi Baines, uh, who is the Minister of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development of Canada. And I may say that is the perfect ministry for the annual meeting of new champions. And I would go on record saying I'd advocate all ministries of industry to consider this as their moniker going forward. Um, and to his left, uh, we have um, Faike Sibesma, who is Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Managing Board of Royal DSM. And I would say, uh, really, beyond that, a great champion of sustainability, of concepts such as the circular economy. His company is very much at the forefront of the fourth industrial revolution, leading in areas of nutrition, health technologies, uh, as well as material science and new energy. So he very much lives and breathes the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, to his left is um, Mei Li, the Dean of the School of Entrepreneurship and Management at Shanghai Tech University. I may add an incredible new champion uh, institution, um, started a few years ago by the Shanghai Municipality and the Chinese Academy of Science. It is an incredible um, center of excellence with already three Nobel laureates in residence among the faculty, um, I think a, an institution to watch. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Mark Benioff, uh, who is the founder and chairman, chief executive of Salesforce USA, member of the board of trustees of the World Economic Forum. And for those um, who listened to carefully the premier's remarks yesterday, and you heard terms or concepts like uh, the cloud and platform. Um, Mark is really one of the pioneers in those areas, but he's also an incredible uh, corporate philanthropist, um, really a true leader in terms of corporate responsibility. So we're delighted to have him among the panel as well. And with that introduction, I'd like to um, turn the question, first question to, to Mark and get his thoughts. I mean, we've spent the past few days discussing the fourth industrial revolution. Um, often, going away from the technological elements, but really focusing on some of the societal elements as well. And one thing I'd, I'd like to hear, because you, you are very um, involved in technology issues, societal issues, um, your thoughts on really where are the near-term uncertainties with respect to this fourth industrial revolution and the long-term opportunities, uh, as well as other thoughts, because a lot of things happen this, this week, as you know, on the news cycle. And, and I'm referencing, of course, the Iceland match. Um, uh, but uh, I'd love to hear from you, Mark, if you could start off the conversation. Well, thank you, Lee, and before I uh, make my comment, let me express my sincere gratitude to you and to your team and the members of the World Economic Forum, including Klaus and Hilda Schwab, for their outstanding leadership in putting this conference together. It's been a very exciting three days, We're very well done, very well organized, and I know everyone here appreciates all the hard work of your team, so thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Great. Um, I also uh, think it's appropriate to talk about the fourth industrial revolution, uh, which is, of course, one of the major themes of uh, Tianjin here, as well as um, Davos, uh, where it was introduced uh, in January. And I believe it's not a coincidence that uh, coming into this conference, there's been so much discussion about what happened last week with uh, Brexit. And uh, specifically, what I would say is that in Davos, of course, uh, the discussions were not forceful around Brexit. In fact, they were somewhat ambiguous, I would say even ten tentative. And even the leaders of the United Kingdom who were there, including David Cameron, in their specific comments to the CEOs, which I personally attended, were kind of, I would say, unremarkable in their content. And because of that, I believe that uh, it was a little bit too little, a little too late, when finally they realized, oh, that there was a real situation and that it could really turn in the wrong direction. And even a group of CEOs uh, placed an advertisement in a uh, London newspaper only a few days before the vote. Unfortunately, it's just not enough. And I believe that this is a great a moment to capture one of the key elements of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which is that leaders, whether they are political leaders or entrepreneurs or CEOs, 
um, social leaders, uh, leaders of NGOs or international organizations, must be much clearer, much be much stronger and more articulate and more outspoken and out front in how they look at the future. That it is not enough to kind of assume that someone else is going to achieve this because there is definitely a crisis of trust in the world today and there's certainly a crisis of trust that many people feel, certainly I believe that's the voice of the uh, UK population and that crisis of trust can only be answered with direct leadership. So uh, th this is what I think is on uh, my mind today. Mark, can I just ask you, you mentioned um, in Davos that uh, it seemed that in a way what happened transpired this week it, it took leaders by surprise, literally in, in surprise. Now the fourth industrial revolution, you know, is in, implicit in that is the rapid speed of change. So how do we help leaders not be surprised? How do we help them become more ready, you know, and prove their readiness for the future? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would really have to commend the World Economic Forum for writing the book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, which is so a book that I've given to all of my employees and also arranged uh, 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 presentations and speeches on. And that's something that I would encourage all CEOs to do because I believe that everyone needs much more education and information about the dramatic nature of the changes that are underway. Of course, it's not just in my industry in information technology or information sciences, and it's not just in the biological sciences that we see with things like CRISPR and so forth, and it's not just in robotics and artificial intelligence and these kind of things which we've seen displayed here. It's very much right in the heart of leadership itself and how leadership is going to have to change and become more agile in its approaches. And it calls for really creations of new types of institutes of this kind of agile leadership that we've heard from Professor Schwab and others. This is really a moment of crisis as well as a moment of opportunity. I think something that the Chinese understand very well. And that's why this is a, such a critical conference and why I'm so pleased we were able to attend it for the last three days. Now, Mark, you, you, le you left us with a notion of agile leadership, and I, I, Navadeep, I look to you because obviously we look to our governments uh, for that leadership, and, and in a way, we don't necessarily associate agility as part of that. <laughs> and yet you, you are responsible for ministry that is really forward-looking. I mean, uh, the remit that you have, but in the context of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, where do you see the uh, near-term uncertainties and which matter in a political sense, but also the long-term opportunities which are very important in, in, in terms of the public interest. So I agree there um, are challenges for government and um, you know, I'm very honored to be part um, of a Canadian government that really understands the importance of the fourth uh, industrial revolution. And you mentioned the name change, but not only did we have a name change, but we also had a change in machinery of government to really reflect the emphasis on innovation, science and economic development coming forward. Um, but I think the fundamental question you're raising is what is the role of government? What can we do to really address the issue around the scope and speed that's being discussed with the fourth industrial revolution? And governments by nature are not designed to be too agile. It's very difficult, as you know. There's a lot of institutional history there, a lot of legacy systems. And so it's very difficult to keep up with the scope and speed. So in Canada, the model that we've created in order to deal with this fourth industrial revolution to be able to really take advantage uh, of the future opportunities is really the power at the federal level to convene. We feel the role of government is fundamentally a role where we have an opportunity to bring all the key actors together. So this is academia, civil society, you have industry, uh, and then you have different levels of government, all coming together. And I think that ability to convene everyone and saying, look, we need to take this on in an inclusive manner because there's a shared sense of responsibility. There's a sense of urgency. And this model has really helped us deal with a range of issues. So for example, on climate change, the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, took a large delegation to Paris for COP21. And he did so because he said, we all have a collective responsibility. And now we're all working together on a solutions for that as well. So with respects to the Industrial Revolution, we feel that an inclusive model is very important. Uh, because I've been uh, listening to many um, uh, individuals throughout the last few days. And the challenge is not uh, the fact that this fourth industrial revolution is taking place, but what would the benefit be to society? And we as government, we understand that we want the benefit to take place that really helps the many, not just the few. And so for us, an inclusive process also therefore in turn means that there will be inclusive growth 
uh, and an opportunity for many. And that's got to be the key focus for government as well. Because, you know, when we're looking at the fourth industrial revolution, if we're not inclusive in terms of engagement, not inclusive in terms of wealth distribution and opportunities, uh, these are challenges that we have to address. Because if we don't, um, this is more cumbersome and more challenging than, say, the next recession. Uh, for us, the next set of disruptions poses bigger challenges. And if we don't deal with this head on in an inclusive manner, uh, then we're, we're going to have a difficult time. Well, you describe bringing uh, different stakeholders being inclusive. I mean, that's very much almost, it's part, it's the essence of the World Economic Forum. Um, but how do you get that through government? Because that's not really the, sort of the DNA in some ways. And how have you sort of, you know, how do you demonstrate that and show, and, and show that leadership? Well, the Prime Minister of Canada really changed the culture. Uh, and he's in the process of changing the culture and the tone of doing that. So uh, it has not been a traditional path that's been pursued uh, by previous governments, but it is a path that this Prime Minister believes in, the desire of collaboration, of working together, and saying, look, we have to find these solutions together. Um, and, you know, it, when you change the culture, then you can deploy strategies. You know, I t tell my business students when I was in academia before, you can have all the great ideas, you can have all the tactics, but if you don't change the culture, mm -hmm. uh, culture uh, is so critical. Uh, you're not going to be able to succeed in, in achieving your goals and outcomes. So we've set, changed the tone, changed the culture. And the power to convene is, is really unique in Canada in our federated structure, right? And so we have that history in the past. But we also have a prime minister that understands that, you know, he has the ability to connect with mm -hmm. different levels of government. Because, you know, when you talk to citizens, when you talk to an average Canadian, they don't care which level of government is finding the solutions. They're saying, look, that's your job. I pay my taxes, it's up to you guys to find out how to move the agenda forward, how to create an environment for me to succeed, how to create an environment for businesses to succeed. And so we don't want to tell them, oh, this is a municipal issue, or this is a provincial issue, or this is a federal issue. That's why we're saying, no, it's a collective issue, um, and we're really creating a new culture where everyone comes together and really puts their best foot forward. And, and that, that call to action is really starting to uh, create a lot of positive results in public policy in Canada. And when you convene uh, the different groups, I mean, in a way, um, you're ensuring that there's a diversity of thinking. And I think of your work, Maine, and, and the new university. And in a way, diversity of thinking, I guess, in, in, in some academic quarters, you might think about interdisciplinary work. Um, again, in, in, the, in your context, as you prepare the next generation of leaders, um, how do you, what do you observe about the fourth industrial revolution that in terms of, of gives you optimism in terms of long-term opportunities, but also some caution with regards to the short-term. So I, I want to pick up a little bit on what uh, both Mark and Navdeep have said, both in terms of institutions and models, as well as the sort of crisis of leadership. Do you want to pull I, the mic a little I, bit? Uh, I think it's yeah, on. Closer. I think that um, the thing I observe, the opportunity and the uncertainty in the near future is simply, it's very simple, actually. I think all the models that we know and observe about government, about corporations, about startups, about technology, about education, are in fact under enormous duress. I think the thing that the fourth industrial revolution has brought is the ability for lots of people to do lots of different things that they couldn't do before. And what I tell my students and what I say often to corporate leaders when we're doing innovation training is that you should question every assumption that somebody brings to the table. So the role of government, what it was 10 years ago, five years ago, what it will be in five years should be and will be completely different. I think the same thing is true for education. The idea of 12 years of primary and secondary education, simply four years of university education, I think uh, is under assault. And I think the corporate structure, what it looks like now and what it should look like to face this sort of increasing flexible world, is it, every aspect we should be questioning. And what I try to teach my students is that fundamental skill of learning how to identify issues and then ask questions at every level. Because I think that's the opportunity we have, is to train a universe of people who know how to do that in a much more dynamic and interactive world. But the danger is that we fall into very narrow universes and talk only to people who agree with us. And I think that is a huge danger for discourse, for society as we know it. And I think as educators, um, we like to think that we can in fact talk to corporations and to government and to uh, philanthropists and, and business people to find a way to bridge that gap because I think that's the biggest danger we have now. 
So how do you prepare? I mean, what you're describing is, you know, are problems that don't have solutions yet, right? You have to, they're not, they'll require novel solutions. And, and in business school uh, parlance, they talk about adaptive leadership. So are you focusing, how do you, uh, in a way, uh, help students become adaptive leaders? So I, I obviously, I, I grew up in the United States, in case you couldn't tell from my Midwestern accent. Um, and I, but I grew up in a Chinese household, and then I've been coming to China for over 30 years. I think that um, as somebody who came to education late in my career, I think that we often associate the term business with something that's much more uh, simplistic and technology or sort of skill-driven than it actually is. Business is an institution, just like a government is an institution, and schools and education is an institution. And institutions are comprised of groups of people and how institutions make decisions, and then individuals and how they make those decisions. So I view my job as an educator as asking my students to think about how they interact, how they make decisions as individuals, and how they can make a difference inside of a system and change that system. So Navdeep talked a lot about culture. I have many students who think that culture is simply that they walk into, and it's not something that they're part of forming and possibly changing. And I think that's a really critical piece of how we think about our youth. This whole crowdsourcing, cloud computing platform is about having many voices at the table and understanding that many decisions and voices can be made from the bottom is part of what we are talking about now in agility of leadership. Leadership used to being one person at the top, lots of people following. When in fact, I think leading into uncertainty is as much about watching from the back and guiding large groups of people to do really different and interesting things. Well, I'd like to, I'll, I'll, at one stage, we'll get back to the issue of culture because we, we, we in a way, the fourth industrial narrative, uh, revolution, its narrative revolves around being human-centric. And, and we talk about, when collectively, we're thinking about culture and civilizations. But I, um, Fike, Royal DSM, I mean, it's been, it's, it's an institution. It has a proud history, yet it's been very innovative. And you're in spaces that I suppose uh, shareholders from a generation ago wouldn't have thought that you'd be in. Um, how did that happen, uh, given the structure uh, and in and, and terms of that you are sort of that classical corporation? How does that change happen? Hmm. Well, if you change an organization or change a company or a country, uh, you need to do something which humans do not like, and that is lifting anchors. And it is very human, I think, to have anchors in your life because that gives certainty security, and we like anchors. And the moment that your boat is loaded with anchors, your boat will not make a lot of progress to a new era. So the first guts you need to have is lift some of the anchors. And then to resist a little bit the enormous temptation that the moment you lifted an anchor, to hook on immediately a new anchor. Because if you do that too fast, the boat will still not move. <laughs> So that means that, that to make progress, and I know people in our company, people in society need anchors, but you need to have the guts to lift anchors, and you need a lot of communication to drift, to sail, to move a little bit without too many anchors, and then, of course, we need new anchors again. And that means guts, that means a vision where to go to, but that means also a lot of communication in that almost strange uh, feeling of, of, of not having anchors. Diving further into the fourth industrial revolution, uh, we focus very much in the discussion about the industrial revolution. We didn't focus so much on the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, because what's new? Technology? New technology? That's nothing new. I mean, technologies have been there a couple of times in life, and therefore we have already three industrial revolutions before. Um, if we dive further into the fourth industrial revolution, I would like to mention three tensions, dilemmas, changes compared with the past. Uh, the first was um, challenges or opportunities. The second is collaboration or alone. And the third one is long-term or short-term. I think a lot of the previous, coming back to the first one, challenges or opportunities, a lot of the first industrial revolutions were very much anchored on opportunities. 
there were no life-threatening developments. We had no climate change. We had not uh, a massive destruction of the planet, etc. Uh, we were looking for opportunities to improve our life. Uh, I think the fourth industrial revolution is different than the others, that it is also addressing big challenges we have in life. You can call that opportunities, but it is to a certain degree different than before. And it moves a little bit from only opportunity driven to also challenge uh, driven. The second element I would call collaboration or alone. Uh, it's different than in the past, I think, that the technologies are doing too complicated, uh, going too fast. You cannot develop it alone anymore. And you will see increasingly that people develop new technologies collectively, sharing patterns, exchanging technologies, collaborations, etc. And that is essentially different than in the past. Although we move a little bit from an individual to a collaborative model, I think the we risk we have is that we do that in an elite and leave behind uh, the people, the voters. And Mark was talking about the Brexit. If we leave behind the people who are concerned about all those technological developments, globalization, etc., then we move from an individual to a collaborative model, but only in an elite. And that is a very dangerous thing. And the third element I would call long-term versus short-term. I mean, these new technologies can only be developed if we have a longer-term view and not only a short-term view. And we do that in an era where quarterly earnings, and I talk uh, out of experience, uh, quarterly earnings, uh, short-termism, activist shareholders, and all that stuff, uh, is increasingly impactful in, in our world, and not always helpful to develop new technologies with a longer term run. So three elements to, to deepen a little bit the discussion on the fourth industrial revolution. So I actually I have a question for the two of you, which is I think the one thing that distinguishes this particular revolution from the previous three is the rate of change, right? So the first derivative keeps going, but the second derivative has really done the hockey stick thing. Um, and I just wonder, when you talk about the difference between long-term and short-term, how long-term is long-term now, given how fast things are changing? Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> well, maybe first facts. Um, long-term shareholding, uh, look to the, industrial, uh, the, the institutional investors. Uh, they... Uh, manage their portfolio managers on a long-term shareholding on an 18, 24, maximum 36 months terminology. That's long-term shareholding. Short-term shareholding, it's more two months, although for some it's two days or two seconds. Seconds, yeah. Um, and um, technologies, we developed um, waste out of agriculture to turn that into green energy. Development of technology is now implemented in the US. It took us eight years to develop the technology. So in that sense, we can only develop those technologies if we really have a long-term commitment. But in the financial world, and there is some tension, an eight years commitment, that is a very long horizon. I don't know how Mark looks through it, but, uh, and this is one of the tensions indeed I see. Mark? Well, I will have to anchor back to uh, use your term, uh, Premier Lee's comments, actually, uh, which he just made in the Q&A session with the CEOs just before uh, this session, where he really outlined uh, the China 2025 plan, which is uh, very clear with its goals and objectives, uh, especially in regards to technology and economic development. And I would really have to commend the Chinese government for having such a well laid out plan, and I even would hope that the United States government would, would have a similar plan. Of course, we have nothing like it. Um, also, you know, when uh, Premier Lee's opening comments in the opening plenary, he made a good comment even about the uh, World Economic Forum here in China, which is that it takes 10 years to create a fine sword, and it also takes 10 years to create a productive tree uh, that can be harvested with fruit. So. You know, I think that uh, this is especially important in today's world because, again, I believe that his comments were extremely relevant when he talked about how he plans to eliminate 
so many jobs in coal, for example, retrain and move uh, to uh, new positions and a resettlement uh, here in China. I thought that was extremely interesting, and also that there was such a large uh, fund, about a hundred billion uh, fund, uh, put together for this uh, effort. So again, this kind of long-term planning and thinking that I think is evidenced in this conference is something that we can take from and, and look. In our own industry, in the technology industry, and something that I've written about as well is that people are always overestimating what you can do in a year and underestimating what you can do in a decade. And that is really true in the technology uh, industry. And I think that it's only through this type of discussion, or I think as the minister correctly said, through a multi-stakeholder dialogue as evidenced by the World Economic Forum, that we're able to kind of achieve those goals. I was going to, Minister, you, you're in public life, 10 years is, wow, that's a long time. <laughs> yes. Um, what is the long term and how do you approach the long term? And, and uh, because perception is that um, public leaders today are really in crisis management const constantly. So how do you get that foresight? How do you, how do you get to the long term? So I think we're in a very similar uh, situation and dynamic with uh, the, the industry as well, where there's short-term pressures, uh, where people uh, want to make sure that governments create an environment where there's jobs, there's security, et cetera. So that pressure does exist in government as well. And with election cycles, uh, in Canada, we had minority governments, for example, in the past. And so there was a lot of uncertainty around when the election would be. And so governments definitely in the past had very short-term perspectives. I think what we're trying to articulate is a combination of both. Um, which is to say there are some short-term successes we want to, to achieve, and then ultimately we want to fundamentally change the culture in Canada as well, and we want to really make Canada uh, a global center of innovation, and we want innovation to be you know, ingrained as a core Canadian value, and that takes a bit of a longer-term uh, trajectory. But the bottom line is on innovation. It really boils down to one key element. It's about people. And as government, as long as we key demonstrate that we're investing in people, uh, that we are improving their skill sets, providing opportunities for them, you know, teaching the next generation, for example, about coding. So right in the, changing the curriculum and saying, look, coding is just as important as reading and writing. So if we start investing in, in, in those kinds of initiatives, that sets us up for long-term success. Um, and so the idea is that we start to implement policies along those lines that really sets us up for long-term success and at the same time, in the short term, really empower individuals who are transitioning from one industry or one sector uh, uh, and trying to fit uh, their skill sets in another sector to provide them with the training that they need in the short term as well. So we really have a, a, a dual responsibility that we're trying to manage. You mentioned coding because I see Mark and Mark, you started at a very young age. And in fact, even today I saw in, in Davos you had uh, a great outreach program called the Coding Dojos. And, and I was from a generation where uh, it wasn't coding, but you may want to learn Japanese at that time, and now it's learning Chinese. But now the, the language is really a, a computer language. And what your, what's your take on that, uh, given your own life experience and your current focus? Well, I think that, of course, coding is probably one of the most important skills that you can acquire today and is a critical skill for the fourth industrial revolution. And it's one of the reasons that I uh, tried to bring so many school children from the city of Davos uh, to um, a, a classroom that we created there with the World Economic Forum to teach them coding. And also, any event that Salesforce does anywhere around the world, we try to do the same thing where we'll bring children to the conference and educate them on what we're doing as well as work with lo local organizations like Coder Dojo or um, uh, other organizations in the United States like Black Girls Code to kind of really show that there's so many opportunities to uh, uh, develop a career in coding like I did. I learned how to code but I was self-taught when I was 14 years old. Today I look at some of these new uh, next generation computers that are available uh, there's one computer that's available by, uh, called uh, Next Thing, and um, this uh, Next Thing computer uh, is only $7. It's a fully functioning computer. That's amazing, and they have another version of it that's comprehensive, including a keyboard and a screen, uh, for $49. So that's amazing, that type of technology put in the hands of uh, middle school children especially, who can learn to code, can really set them up 
uh, for successful coding careers early as graduating high school. And uh, this is the kind of thing that we need to invest in. I'm doing that both at Salesforce and also personally. And I believe that we need to develop more of these things. Another great example is a company called Kano, which is a computer kit made out of these components um, where you can kind of assemble your own computer for under $100. And uh, these kinds of things that will be $5, $10, $50, or $100 that can be fully functional computers that children can learn means that every child in middle school throughout the world can have a computer. And uh, this, this can be a game changer if, uh, if, we are, if we embrace this. So we picked up on a C, that's coding, but you, earlier you talked about culture and collaboration. And, um, and that seems to be really the, the way you build the agility to deal with the fourth industrial revolution. Um, you are um, responsible, really, in your various, as, as educators, as uh, minister, as uh, CEOs, to, to actually m make your institutions more collaborative and make that part of the culture. How do you do that? Doesn't sound that easy. It's hard to see. I mean, even here, uh, we've talked, uh, if you talk to some of the academics that were here and the scientists, uh, the difficulties of really being rewarded for interdisciplinary research, um, to create teams, to collaborate, yet it seems very central to, to really the question of how we're going to prosper in the fourth industrial revolution. Mm. Do you have any thoughts on, on collaboration and culture and how do you make that work? Well, I mean, just from a government policy point of view, we um, unveiled our innovation agenda, six themes, a few weeks ago in Canada. And one of the areas we focused on was investments in creating ecosystems and super clusters. And the underlying premise of that is saying, look, we want to create an environment where you have all the stakeholders, civil society, academia, uh, industry, governments coming together and collaborating. And that's where the magic happens. And so we're actually creating an environment, like I mentioned before, with the power to convene, making investments, um, and creating these ecosystems. And you know, I've seen this take place already within academic institutions in Canada, where you have, for example, the arts department and the engineering department working in collaboration with the business department. And when they come together, that's where you see a lot of this innovation taking place. And so we want to replicate that on a grander scale. And we're doing that in Canada, for example, as part of our innovation agenda. So it is doable. Uh, it requires leadership. Uh, it requires a vision. Uh, and it requires buy-in from you know, different segments of society. And so I think the responsibility government has to do is to articulate the benefits of that uh, in a tangible way. And when that's done, then I think everyone steps up and participates in a meaningful way. Mm. Michael, did you want to step in? Well, let me respond by two small anecdotes. Because you say, how do we teach collaboration? Uh, how do we teach collaboration to whom? To the younger generation or to the people, apologies, in the room? including myself. Um, because recently we were coaching uh, some young entrepreneurs, uh, really young entrepreneurs. I'm talking about people between 16 and 24 years old, really young people. And I was sitting with two young guys, and they were more or less in the same business. And one was revealing more or less the things to the other. And I said to one, well, I was coaching him. Um, don't tell all the secrets you have to him. He's maybe a competitor. And two guys looked to me, this is so old fashioned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we collaborate. And, uh, and I was wondering who is coaching whom here. <laughs> a second anecdote I recently had, and I told it before in the forum, is my older son, 18 years old. He needed to drive from our home time to Rotterdam, one and a half hour. And I said, you can take the car of your mom. I would love to do that when I was 18. And he said, yeah, but it's one and a half hour and I need to drive back tomorrow, that's three hours. I said, yeah, true. He said, I take the train. He said, that's also three hours. He said, no, no, no. In the car, I lose three hours of my life in two days. In the train, I continue my life because I'm connected to the rest of the world in my mobile devices. I said, Jesus, you lose three hours of your life? <laughs> I said, yeah. So I am wondering who do we need to teach about collaboration. A younger generation is operating already essentially different. We learn to negotiate by playing cards. We have a set of cards. We play this card. If you play now that card, a younger generation puts all the cards at the table 
and said, okay, what are your cards, what are my cards, how can we deal that better? It's a different game. Mm. May, do you, are you learning from your students here in this regard? So I said to my students yesterday, I went back to Shanghai to teach that in my world, I learn as much from the students as I learn, as they might learn from me, and that they learn from each other much more. But I think this anecdote really does go to the heart of what I said, which is I think all the assumptions that we make and all the institutions and regulations that we have are predicated on a model that no longer works. So the idea, in fact, my next discussion with the students tomorrow is around the topic of academic integrity, something that we care quite a lot about. But it's predicated on certain notions that might be outdated. Not that I think integrity is outdated, but the idea that people should collaborate in a fundamentally different way, sort of open source coding. You know, I talk to my computer scientists about how they can work together without copying code or attribution. I think those are all things that we try to teach our students. So we are fortunate, and we're talking, I mean, clearly, the, the, uh, there's a generation closer to the future than us. Um, and I'm pretty sure that there must be a global shaper or a young scientist uh, here in the room. And maybe one could pose a question to the panel, um, and then we'll, we'll have to we'll go through another round. But uh, any, anybody from that generation can teach us here on the panel today? Anything? <laughs> Do I see anyone? I thought like, there was a hand here. Yeah, I saw a hand as well. We can get a microphone, perhaps. Or if you want to step up, we could. Um, from Chandigarh Hub, uh, so you just asked the question if there's an, any global shapers. I was like, yeah, I am. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I, I um, caught you that so, way. But uh, please, uh, it comes with a question. Yeah, so, um, so I'm from the educational background. So, um, so my question is more inclined towards that. Um, we are talking about the fourth industrial revolution, right? We're talking about technologies, robots, and everything. But having said that, I, I also feel you need to uh, look at, and that's what my question to the leaders is, how we are actually educating our children. I mean, um, especially in Canada, they welcome the Syrian refugees. Um, is there, is there uh, a plan to embed how to accept uh, other communities and know more about communities? Because that's also one of the biggest challenges that we are facing, that, you know, we just don't know, uh, you know, what the other community is and feels and believes in. So. Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. I think it's very at the heart of this generation as well. Anybody want to? If I may on that, but I got a bit of a bias because in Canada, uh, we fundamentally believe that diversity is our strength. Uh, we believe that the fact that uh, we have such an inclusive society that we really promote the equality of opportunity really is the underpinning of uh, an innovative society. Uh, that, you know, if you have that kind of environment where you collaborate with people from different backgrounds and you understand those different perspectives, it makes you a better person. It allows you also the ability to find solutions to difficult problems. And so we feel that is a competitive advantage for Canada. And, uh, and I said this in a few of the discussions earlier as well. We're spending a lot of effort and time and energy in strengthening our local pipeline through investments in STEM. But we're also looking at immigration policies and how to increase those immigration levels to really attract the best and brightest to build on that diversity. Because that is at the end the core of our innovation agenda. It really is about people and creating an environment where they can truly thrive. And you're absolutely right. The diversity of backgrounds and perspectives is so critical to that. And, and from a Canadian perspective, we have a strong history of that and we want to continue to build on that. So, it may be if I may, Ali. A small remark on, on that one. I, I totally agree that um, uh, diversity is an important element. What we do nowadays in our company is teach the people the difference between men and women. And, and that is not what we teach at schools. At schools, we give sexual education to people who do not need that education at that age anymore. Um, and we don't teach the difference between men and women. And recently was in one of those courses internally, and it was a guy of 50 years old who said, gee, I now understand much better that men and women are essentially different. I would like to have had this course when I was 25 years old and would have started my marriage. And I think that this is an example of things which we can teach much better at schools. Differences between cultures, differences between men and women, those kind of differences. And I think that would 
enable and facilitate the whole collaboration model very much. So if I can, we, on that note, we were focusing as we close here on, on this future generation now. In the course of my conversations, um, I ran into uh, a professor who told me about a practice called the three-minute dissertation where the doctoral students have to show one slide and three minutes explain their dissertation. We have about five minutes, so what I will ask you to do is the one-minute commencement speech because this is the month in, this, in China where earlier this month uh, uh, really um, millions of students took their national university exams, and next uh, week in, in this part of the world, including Singapore as well and East Asia and China, we'll have commencement and graduation. Now, we've been spending the last 40 minutes discussing really the implications, uh, the, the positive, the potential of the fourth industrial revolution. In a minute, if I can get from each of you, what's that commencement speech? Would, what would be the high, that point you'd share with the re graduates next week, particularly in this country, in China? Mark, would you want to start? Well, I think that uh, I'll start with, uh, or end how I started, which is that, you know, um, we are in the fourth industrial revolution, which is, uh, of course, going to be heralded by all these amazing new technologies and wonders of the world that we've never seen. And of course, these technologies themselves are never good or bad. It's what we do with these technologies that actually means something. So therefore, you know, us as the leaders uh, have to step forward and we have to step forward with more strength, more clarity, and more articulation of what we actually care about and what we mean. And this is going to be uh, scary for a lot of people like myself who are CEOs of companies where it's not always uh, appropriate or uh, encouraged to speak out. And I think that, you know, as we just heard, you know, you have a lot of people around, maybe they're uh, shareholder activists or whatever, they're looking for you to make a misstep so you're in a scary environment as a CEO. Well, you have to transcend your fear because today's world in the fourth, fourth uh, industrial revolution means there is no room for fear. If there is an issue, whether it's about equality for your employees or gender pay and gender equality, whether it's um, making sure that a, a class of citizen is protected, making sure that uh, technology is properly implemented, or that your own visions and values in your organization are preserved, or your country, then you have to be stronger, more clear, more articulate, and more forceful than ever before. And if you don't, then you will pay a price, which is what we just saw witnessed last week. May, you actually probably will have to give a few of these speeches next week, so in a minute. So I, I say often to my students, I say two things, and one of them does key off what Mark just said. I think, in fact, uh, the greatest danger that we face in this world is the deep, deep fear that so many people feel about the future. And I think that fear stops us then from embracing the world. I, I happen to grow up in an immigrant family uh, in a working class neighborhood at the time my parents didn't have much money, so I had the opportunity to go to standard American public schools uh, at a time when the United States was fighting a war in Vietnam against communist China. I have a very, I had the, I had the luxury of a very unique and diverse background in growing up in the United States, uh, and I had the opportunity that a country like the United States could afford my family. So I think embracing the world, not being afraid, I think is really critical. But I think the other piece that we don't talk about is forgiveness. I think the world moves so quickly. I think that there are pictures taken at every moment. I think if we want to encourage people to innovate and we want to encourage people to make mistakes, then we also need to be forgiving of people who make mistakes. And I think that for people in a deep position, I think for people in government, for people who are CEOs, one misstep, one misstatement, you know, the judge makes a decision that people disagree with and it's all over social media. They should be fired, they should be stepped. I, I think that forgiveness is fundamentally part of the human condition that we must embrace as we also ask people to, to overcome their fear. Otherwise, I think they're mutually exclusive. Absolutely. Fika? Three dares and one realization. And I said it before, dare to lift anchors, otherwise you don't make progress dare in this short-term world to focus on the long-term and dare to share with other people. And if you do those three dares, realize that the bright signs which is there 
can really help to create a brighter life for many. Navdi? So I grew up in, in a household where my grandparents raised me. And uh, in Punjabi, there's a saying called chardikala, which is positive thinking. And for me, I'm an optimist. I always have been. I've always got a smile on my face because of that. And, and for me, the message would be to the next generation is if you want to succeed, as mentioned by some of the other speakers, you have to be prepared to fail. But remember, fail fast, learn fast, and never quit. As long as you have that mindset, uh, you can achieve anything you want. Well, let me thank each of you, um, really, for sharing and really caring about the issue. That's my pet phrase, is sharing and caring. And, and we really benefit from your wisdom today. Uh, I'd like, let us all thank the, the panel uh, um, for really enriching us in this discussion. Now, we were really, a, I think, a great warm-up act for what will be a very special performance. Now, I'll ask many of you if you would please remain seated as we prepare the stage, and then I'll introduce this very special musical performance. So if you please remain seated, and thank you again, fellow panelists. Thank you.